everybody uh, to our third book club. And it's wonderful to see you all here. Um, and uh, we as Israeli uh, made a pre-meeting before, but we still have a lot of things to hear and to speak about. And now Avital will uh, tell you a little bit about our uh, uh, partnership together, and then uh, Marcy will take charge. Well, welcome everyone. This is so exciting. Um, well, first of all, if you're here, you're part of a program called Partnership Together, uh, which is a uh, part of the Jewish agency that connects uh, the Western Galilee with uh, 16 communities in the US and uh, Budapest, Hungary. So now I'm very excited because we have, I counted the, all the registers and we have 13 communities participating in this call. 13 out of, uh, out of uh, 18. So it's pretty, pretty nice. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for joining us and uh, thank you um, for making this uh, connection. I wanted to uh, especially thank the friends from uh, Springfield, uh, Nancy and her, Harry Berman, who made the connection with uh, Gabriel Savit. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, Nancy to say a little bit, to introduce Gabriel before, um, before the session. It's, it's my pleasure. And um, again, I want to thank Harry Berman, who after the first book club meeting suggested Anna and the Swallow Man for the P2G book club. And um, I also want to thank Nancy and Pat Chesley, whose leadership brought the Jewish Federation to partnership just one year ago. And ever since, we've seen the benefits to our community. Springfield is the capital of Illinois, known for the home of Abraham Lincoln and for our world-class Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. It's also the boyhood home of Jewish philanthropist Julius Rosenwald. We boast a Frank Lloyd Wright House, the old state capitol, and much, much more. We hope that someday you'll all visit Springfield. Our total population is 117 people, and our Jewish population is approximately 930, with two temples, Chabad, B'nai B'rith, Hadassah, and our small Jewish Federation of Springfield with the Jewish Community Relations Council. We're very pleased that Gavriel or Gavi moved to Springfield with his daughter Livy and wife Livia a little over a year ago. Livia is an assistant professor of English and modern languages at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Gavi was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, grew up in a modern Orthodox home and graduated from the University of Michigan with a BFA in musical theater. He has performed on Broadway, off Broadway, in Brussels and Tokyo, just to name a few of the places. His book, Anna and the Swallow Man, published in 2016, has been translated into 16 different languages. It made the New York Times bestseller list and the New York Times called it a splendid debut. Before turning this over to our moderator, Marcy Paul, JCRC Director of Jewish Federation of Dayton and Gavi, I'm excited to let you know that Gavriel's new book, The Way Back, will be released September 15th and can be pre-ordered on Amazon. And now to Marcy Paul and Gavriel. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Avital. Thank you, Noah. Welcome, everybody, to our third book club. Um, I'm very excited. Uh, we had the chance to meet Gabriel uh, earlier, just to meet him, talk with him. So um, let's get to it, because I know a lot of you have some questions, and I get to start. So, Gabriel, I, I got to find you on our screen. Here I am. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome. Welcome again. A um, couple of general questions first. Mm -hmm. You started out as a musical actor. What drew you to this medium, to, to that medium of musical acting? Um, so uh, I started acting in high school. 
Um, I was involved in sort of all of the different theatrical productions at uh, Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which has perhaps the least imaginative mascot in the history of high school there, the Pioneer Pioneers. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I just I got really I, I got really into theater. Um, I studied music from a very young age. I started studying the violin at age three, and so I had a strong grounding in music. And I was in orchestra and in choir uh, at that time, and so I was uh, able to bring music and theater together. And I discovered I had a little bit of talent there. And um, I, I guess the rest is kind of history. <laughs> All right. Thanks. And. So what transitioned you to writing? That's a good question. I mean, as much as I have been interested in music and in theater, I've always been a reader. Um, and I used to say that I, I never really thought of myself as a writer. And that's sort of true and sort of not true, which is to say I never really considered writing as a career. Um, but once I, I got into it uh, as a career, I sort of started looking back and discovered that I had been doing a lot of like recreational writing that I never took seriously. Um, so I guess it was kind of there the whole time. Uh, certainly this project um, came out of uh, a sort of desire to keep artistically engaged. I wrote it when I was 24 and between performing jobs in New York City. At the time I was working in a tiny little Mexican restaurant uh, in Crown Heights on Franklin Avenue, which is actually, it's phenomenally named. It's named after Chavela Vargas, uh, the, the wonderful Mexican singer. So it's called Chavela's, but uh, if you're of our persuasion, you might easily walk down the street and look up and see the sign and read Chavela's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they have excellent fish tacos, by the way, if you're, if you're ever around. If you're ever um, but yeah, I was working in the basement fielding um, uh, delivery orders and I was very, very bored. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start playing around with this story that I've got in my head. And here we are. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so one of the questions that we always ponder and talk about is how do you write? Do you have a structure to your writing day? Where do you write? How do you do it? So I am very lucky to be able to write full time uh, insofar as anyone with a toddler can be saying to do to can be said to be doing anything full time. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, at the moment, um, I'm switching off every other morning child care and writing with my wife so we can both kind of get half of our full time jobs in. Um, and I, I get up in the morning, I uh, do I think I do my best writing first thing. Uh, so I get myself a nice big glass of cold brew and I sit down and I uh, turn on, um, actually, so I think we're going to talk about this a little bit more later. I um, One of the first things I do when I start working on a project is I put together a sort of uh, uh, reference playlist, I guess, um, something that sort of captures the atmosphere that I'm looking to, uh, to, to get in the project and uh, works kind of evocatively and, and is sort of like a Pavlov's bell for me. So I'll put on uh, that playlist for the project that I'm working on and dive into my cold brew and, and do my best to, to write. I, I mean, anyone who is writing seriously knows that you can really only get at most like five hours of serious work in a day. After that point, you're just, you know, fiddling and moving words around in ways that probably aren't all, all that effectual. So it's it's helpful that I have distractions like a wonderful daughter and a wonderful mm -hmm. dog and a wonderful wife to <laughs> uh, take up my time while I'm while I'm not working. But yeah, I, I do my best to uh, to be in the flow every day if I can. Uh, usually, I'll grab an hour or two during a nap, even if it's not my primary working day these days. Um, I just kind of keep on rolling until there's a draft. So this leads me to a question, and we'll talk about the Spotify and, and your music. So does your music inform your writing or does your writing inform your music? Chicken, eggs. <laughs> okay, that, that's your yeah, answer. No, I, certainly the idea is there before uh, the music is. I think I use the construction of the playlist as an opportunity to kind of 
begin putting down ideas in a, in a less formal way so that I can feel the project before I have to commit to any, you know, words. Um, and so definitely the, the act of putting together the playlist helps inform the writing. And then often if I find myself stuck on the writing, I'll go back to the playlist and see if there's something that's bothering me or something that I can add in um, just as a sort of way to, to get me reaching out and looking for new ideas. Okay, we sent out your playlist, and so I'm sure there are going to be other questions. And and um, I'm not sure if, if I'm glad I read the book, or I wish I had listened to your playlist first. It's really interesting. That's the chicken and the egg for the reader as well. So I lo I love that because it is part of the larger narrative, right? I mean, it's if you know about it and you and you have the access to it. Um, so this was your first novel and, and to rave reviews. Can you talk a little bit about your inspiration for the specific novel? I mean, you talked about being in the restaurant and all that, but what, what led you to this story? Yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot of, look, any, any novel worth its salt is necessarily a combination of a lot of diverse influences. Um, it's always really interesting after like the final product is birthed to like go back and try and pick apart all the all the different pieces because the work of creating a novel is bringing together all these diverse pieces some some of which you're not necessarily even aware of as you're writing um, I definitely remember that when this idea was uh, coming together I was thinking a lot about um, I think it's called fragments there's a fraudulent holocaust memoir but I think uh, the name of the of the writer, and I was thinking a lot about the sort of freighted nature of Holocaust narratives and World War II narratives, and how truth and falsehood, particularly in those sorts of stories and testimonies, takes on a whole new sort of um, moral weight. And I was also thinking about uh, myth making. Um, I remember I, there's a fantastic BBC uh, radio program called In Our Time in which like a very, very snooty fellow named Melvin Bragg uh, interviews several expert, experts on a particular topic. I remember listening to one podcast version on the um, sources of the Robin Hood narrative and how they came out of sort of rumors and ballads and they sort of grew in the telling amongst many different tellers and that way it's it's really an organic myth and I was thinking about the way that stories like that stories that are heightened and truer than true uh, always tend to crop up around moments of extreme historical significance and I was sort of thinking about whether it was necessarily morally uh, objectionable to make myth about the Second World War and the ha Holocaust or whether it could be enriching in some way. So that was definitely one of the big ideas in my mind. And then just there's a lot of questions about uh, identity and language, about um, truth and falsehood, and certainly about uncertainty, which I think for me is the, the final cornerstone of the book and what, what it sort of ends up being about. So um, yes, lots of questions in my head and, and, and they're not following my, my list anyways, but um, so what other, what other research did you do during this process? Um, so it's interesting. I think it was Nathan Englander who said something like in the age of Google and Wikipedia, um, a scrupulously researched historical novel is not that impressive, which is true. Um, because there's, there are a few different uh, levels of research that are necessary in writing in history, which is how I like to write. Uh, one of them is to sort of understand the general milieu and where all the sort of historical and cultural pieces are on the chessboard, so to speak, uh, the, the given conditions. And then there's stuff like, you know, really specific details that you might want to know. Like, for example, I remember Googling at one point um, in the writing of this novel, uh, what precisely was in a Soviet, a World War II Soviet soldier's uh, ration kit, which, <laughs> believe it or not, you can find out if you go to like the very anal retentive uh, historical uh, reenactor sites, 
those guys have like they've got it all um so yeah there's a lot of like very small detail work that's blessedly available uh, via the internet right now and then beyond that a lot of it is uh, aesthetic, like putting together uh, the playlist, or I often have um, have a big cork board in my office that I put up reference pictures on, and then the rest of it is just kind of making sure that historically you don't have a tin ear, you know, you, that you understand really where you are and what's going on. I think um, what was really wonderful was Michelle Bukai from Indianapolis sort of traced the story as best she could with a map. Mm. And so she shared that on our WhatsApp um, uh, group. And and that brought together a, a whole nother life of, of your book. So that mm -hmm. we'll have to share that with you. Um, yeah, so you. Yeah, we'll send that to you. So you mentioned um, identity and language as two themes. And there's so many themes in the novel. And we're going to get we're going to get um, to them with with everyone's questions. I just want to throw out some and see if you want to pick up on any right now. Um, uncertainty, music, language, identity, birds, Holocaust, family. Um, when you started writing, were you aware that of those themes, that, that numerous number of themes, or did they organically evolve? Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think that... Um... It's, it's not on, the, on a conscious level, like this is going to be one of the strands that I weave in. It's sort of, uh, you know, I actually, I think of it a lot like uh, there's that scene uh, after Reb Herschel's been hung when the swallow man invites all the birds to his funeral. And I, I, I think of it in that way, sort of um, about kind of like laying out the invitation and, and seeing what shows up, you know, in a book like this, which is necessarily about identity at a certain level, language is going to show up um, because language is one of the defining uh, characteristics of our identi identities, particularly as Jews, we are necessarily in conversation with our sort of multilingual uh, identities. Um, uh, in terms of music, that's sort of deep in my soul. Uh, I think music and language are very much akin, um, and certainly music and identity inform one another. You walk down the halls of any high school, and you will see that those people are, you know, <laughs> identifying themselves with music. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, and it's also it's something that grows in the telling, right? You, as you work and refine on the material that you put down, you start to recognize who's showing up to the table and make sure that they're they're part of the conversation as you go along uh, so it's it, and it's hard you know because in some ways writing a novel is a very intellectual activity and in other ways it's a very irrational activity um and it necessarily engages subconscious and pre-conscious and post-conscious portions uh of of yourself as well as the uh, sort of conscious level so, so you're equating irrational with that, with that um, subconscious level? Yeah, I think in the, in the, in the technical sense uh, of irrational, not rational, right? I think, I think there's um, an unfortunate uh, uh, connotation to irrationality these days. I think we are, as human beings, fundamentally irrational creatures as much as we are fundamentally rational creatures. And I think that trying to avoid that makes problems rather than solving them. I think engaging with our irrational faculties, it's the only way to make sure that we're fully integrated as people. Um, and I certainly think that my approach to my work is as irrational as it is rational. And I, 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 kind, of, I kind of guess that most people uh, operate in, in similar ways, whether or not they're aware of it. Because you know, ultimately, what we like and what we dislike that's not a rational process. It's it's a it's a sort of deep animal thing, and it informs everything that we do. And so I, I just think that we should make space for that in uh, in the way that we live our uh, live our lives and do our work because it's going to show up whether we do or not. I'm going to ponder and reflect on that because <laughs> how you would define rational and I would define rational may be irrational. So I'm sure. going to just let that go and. Um, Okay, so before we get, I have one last 
one last question. And um, I think it speaks to that rationality issue. Um, and then we'll get on to everyone else. So I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna share a quote that happens toward the end. And um, Swallowman, um, uh, Anna says to Swallowman, one day I would like to know everything like you. And Swallowman says, I do not know everything, my dear, and I do not desire it either. I cannot imagine it would be very pleasant. Knowledge is, of course, very important because the things that we know become our tools. And without good tools at our disposal, it is quite difficult to remain alive in the world. To me, that, that was the essence of, of the story. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna ask you about that. As, can you speak to that? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I absolutely yeah. do. Um, I think you're you're completely right. I think that's uh, very much the center of the story, um, and I think it very much speaks to what we were just talking about in terms of rationality and irrationality. Um, I do, however, want to. I happen to have a copy of the book here. I want to continue the quotation because yes. I think the second yes. half is just as important as the first. Yeah, half, absolutely. But. Knowledge is also a kind of death. A question holds all the potential of the living universe within it. In the same way, a piece of knowledge is inert and infertile. Questions, Anna, questions are far more valuable than answers, and they do much less blowing up in your face as well. If you continue to seek questions, you cannot stray far off the proper road. And so that I think, this is, you know, it's, it's the impression of conflict between certitude and uncertainty, between rationality and irrationality, that um, I think children balance so well. They are little rationalizing monsters, right? <laughs> like they, they're trying to figure everything out and they're doing an amazing job. They do much better at understanding things than we do as adults. Um, and also they live quite literally in a magical state of consciousness. Things happen that they, I mean, they could never possibly understand and they have heavyweight and significance and are, it's often the first time that they experience colors of emotion, you know? I, so my daughter's almost two and she's started to turn this corner. Many of you with children will, will recognize this where she is now engaging with her emotions and sometimes she feels sad and that's a new thing. And I think we, we tend to overlook the profundity of those first experiences because the people are small. Children are physically small, right? So we assume that their emotional experiences are in some level commensurate with their physical size and that they're small or unimportant. When in fact, I think those first experiences of emotion are far more important and far larger. Um, and they give, and then that, though they're, they're irrational, right? They're deeply, by definition, they're irrational. Um, and so I think part of the, um, I don't know, part of the architecture of the book is the way that Anna can exist in certainty and uncertainty at the same time and in rational and irrational frames of mind at the same time. And I completely agree with you. I think that's the center of the book. Um, and a lot of people have gotten very angry at me because the, the end of the book is similarly certain and uncertain. Um, and I, I guess I left it there because I, I didn't want to force Anna to enter into the certitude of adulthood at the end of the book. I, I wanted to try and prolong that space because I think it's the best space. I wish I could be there all the time <laughs> um, and I'm doing my best to get there. Well, and I, I think, and, and I had underlined that second part as well. So I'm glad you referenced that because I think in some ways that second paragraph, it's, it's on page 228 is even more important than the first part. Mm -hmm. um, because, and also leaving the book at the end is, is really takes up all of our experiences, mm -hmm. all of our life experiences. Um, we say uh, epistemologically, um, you know, who we are will lead us down that path of what we think Anna does as an yeah. adult or, as a, or, or right. whether she exists as an adult. And so yeah. we can't forget that our life experiences really direct us in cert on certain paths. 
Yeah, I okay. completely agree with that. And I want to say, in fact, we experimented with some endings that were further down the road that were more contemporary even, uh, that gave you a, a clear shot at what had happened to Anna. And they were all far less um, satisfying. And, you know, I, it, I even wrote a version in which I explicitly said, you know, here are different things which might possibly have happened. And even that was less satisfying than just ending on the question of what is out there. Yeah. Yeah, As too many of us wanted that answer, but you didn't give it to <laughs> You're us. You're supposed to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. And, and I thank you, I feel very privileged to, to start this off. Um, so what we're gonna do is people are going to ask their questions, raise their hands. We have a lot of people online. We have six, almost 60 people. So, um, and then you can you can send your questions via the chat or to me privately. We have one question to get us started that was asked. Can you um, tell us about the audience you were writing for specifically, your, your primary target? Yeah, I try not to target. Um, I, I, I try to do my best not to chase the market at all. I, I, I have ideas and I have stories and I put them down and whoever can pick them up you know, I honestly, I think the best writing for young people is also writing for older people. Um, there are, it doesn't quite necessarily work the other way around. I think there are things that are predicated on experience and frankly disappointment that are not necessarily accessible to younger readers in the same way. But I'm, I, I guess, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm on a quest to live in that childlike space. Um, and so I think my stories i mean people people often look at the the diction of the writing and say oh this is this is very complex this is very adult i don't know i mean i the first book that i picked up was rudyard kipling's the jungle book mm -hmm. which is a book for young people it just happens to have been written at the end of the 19th century yeah. um and from my experience you know as we were talking about before kids have sticky brains um <laughs> you give them new words and new ideas and they figure it out or they don't, in which case they didn't need it. Um, so I, yeah, no, I, I, I think about clarity when I write, but I don't think about particular audience because in my experience, that just closes things down. Thank you. All right, so um, I'd like to know if um, Anna and the Swallow Man were supposed to be Jewish or was it purposely not clear? Uh, I would say that that uncertainty is a, a strong theme throughout the book. And if you find yourself asking a question and feeling like there are arguments on both sides, you've probably stumbled over a little note of uncertainty that, that, that's been left for you there. And that brings up the next question we were asked. What do you think Reb Herschel's, well, first, so why Reb Herschel? Why do you introduce him? Um, as a Jewish character. And then the question is, uh, what what do you think his favorite piece of music was? That's an excellent question. It's an yeah. excellent question. My, I'm going to answer the second part first because my brain is leaping to it. I don't think uh, Reb Herschel's style of music is composed music. I think Reb Herschel's the kind of guy who likes to sit around with other musicians and play. Um, and so I think probably Reb Herschel will have had memories of particularly good jam sessions that that stick with him. Um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think he's he's a big fan of Mahler, for example. <laughs> um, why Reb Herschel? That's an interesting question. I think in some ways, um, Reb Herschel is the piece of grit in the um oyster that that makes the pearl you know um the swallow man's got a plan for everything and as i was just saying in terms of music i think the reb herschel is the antithesis of planning um and in much the same way that the swallow man appreciates the importance of careful thought uh it was important to introduce an element of uh, this is another word that has um, sort of a negative weight attached to it, and it probably deserves it more in this case than in the case of irrationality, but a, a sort of element of chaos, you know, um, 
life that can't be controlled. Um, and in some ways, I think the question, the ultimate question of uncertainty is precipitated for Anna by the presence of Reb Herschel. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't have any more questions in the chat, so do we have any hands raised? Avital, do you want to help and Noah help uh, with I, this? I saw that uh, Lisa Stone raised a hand. Lisa? And then unmute you yourself. You can unmute. I, unmute. Can ask, I can ask Gabrielle the question. Did you have the whole story in your head when you started and on a different angle? I, I have a grandson who's 12, so I want to know if you've spoken to young people who've read the book, how they... Uh, related to it and were they able to understand the episode in which uh, Anna gets the medicine and how she how she gets it which you handled very uh, discreetly I, I appreciated that it um, they didn't have to understand it completely thank you I appreciate that um, so did I have the whole story in my head when I started writing? Um, the answer to that question is always yes and no, because, you know, the process of, of making art in general and certainly writing fiction is always involved in figuring it out as you're putting it down. You know, you, you can really, you can think about it in, in as, a, as a metaphor um, in terms of, of, you know, drawing a portrait, right? like you know what the person looks like you've seen the person the person is in your brain but you don't know precisely how you're going to put it down until you put it down so uh you know it doesn't it doesn't come from anywhere else it all <laughs> comes from from inside so in that sense yes of course and then also there's definitely uh making the piece of work is all about figuring out precisely how it goes down so this is another one of those probably slightly unsatisfying yes and no answers. Um, in terms of Anna uh, and the pharmacist at the end, um, you know, we talked a little bit about when we were um, finalizing the text of the book about whether there was any element of um, irresponsibility and not um, and giving Anna any agency in this situation. And the um, conclusion that we came to ultimately was, you know, we, we I, I say specifically that she's a child and the pharmacist is an adult and it's not her responsibility and it's not her fault, which is true. Um, and also, you know, children unfortunately experience things like this. And I think it's important not to remove them from the equation when they're reading about it, um, because it has to be a human experience for those people. They have to be able to recognize themselves in, in, in these experiences or else we've taken away a, a part of their humanity. Um, so it's difficult, of course, it's not pleasant um, but I think, you know, we were aiming for delicacy and discretion and also credit and humanity. Um, because as I say, you know, it's unfortunate that, that there will be children who read this book who have had similar experiences, but there will be. And I think if one is willing to explore experiences like that for the sake of fiction, then one is obligated to make sure that those people can find themselves uh, in the descriptions. All right, thank you. We have we have some other questions, so um, let me let me get them, and then I see uh, Pat down here. Ainat, um, could you tell us more about the meeting? with the old German in Gdansk. <laughs> I, um, I fear that this is, this is, is bordering on the, uh, can you, can you uh, clear up some uncertainty for me question? Um, I, I, uh, what more would you like me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go on from there. So Michelle <laughs> Bukai has a question. 
Um, okay, so I the, the book I get on one level is sort of like a fairy tale. And on the other hand, I really need to um, find out more information. So I'm the one with the maps because I needed to understand what. And then, I, I mean, I think it's a great book because it also sent me researching about Operation Barbarossa. And I was researching about the night that the academics were, uh, right, in, in Poland where the book starts. Mm -hmm. So it's great in that I was researching all that. Now, I know that you're, if I ask you, so who's the swallow man, you're gonna give an answer like you gave the other person. So that's not what I'm gonna ask. Um, I conclude, however, from the medication that I researched, because I had no idea what that was, and that it could be taken for radiation, um, that Swallow Man might have been a nuclear uh, scientist and that he knew what, um, he had information about how to develop the bomb and he escaped. And then when they reached Danzig, he um, agreed, and, that, and just correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> he agreed uh, that he would continue developing the bomb in order to save Anna. And then Anna was taken away by the fishermen. Could there be any truth in what I'm guessing? Yeah, you've certainly, uh, you've done your research. Um, and it is certainly the case that there are, um, you know, it's I'm not I'm not scattering seeds to the wind here. There's architecture beneath the uncertainty, and there are certainly decisions that particular characters make, difficult decisions, I think, in every case. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I I definitely think your interpretation is is uh, a reasonable one. Okay, thank and you. And I apologize for my incorrect pronunciation. I, I was pronouncing it the way my father taught me, so he was wrong. I blame him. <laughs> Um, so Pat, you had a question. Yes, I uh, liked how you started the book. It gave me, where Anna didn't know a lot of things, it gave me a lot of empathy for it. And one of the things that I enjoyed about the book was my feelings toward her and you know how she was on her own teamed up with the swallow man, like a parent sort of taking care of her. Then with the pharmacist incident and she had her loss of innocence and it, it gave me comfort, more comfort when she's going off with the fisherman that she could survive in the future. I, you know, I, I just, just making an observation really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things about uncertainty, right, is that um, as tantalizing as it is, and as much as we want resolution for our sort of pattern seeking brains, um, it's also true that uncertainty leaves open all sorts of glorious possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think one of the one of the things that's so interesting about this book is that, at, you know, when I do meetings like this, people uh, very often want to know, you know, what happened to her afterwards? And I can make up a story for you. <laughs> <laughs> the fact of the matter is there's no answer. And that's one of the, I think, really magical things about fiction, right? Like it ends where it ends and you all gloriously have engaged with this text and you have ideas and feelings and notions of where we hope it could have gone, where it might have gone. And that's, to me, that's incredibly, um, incredibly flattering. And I'm, I'm so glad that people have been engaged with the book in this way. Um, and I think it just demonstrates uh, the, the really wonderful potential of uncertainty to, to grow new ideas. So we have another question. Anna wasn't emotional when her father didn't return or so we think or believe. Why, 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 why did this person ask? So I think, uh, I think Anna probably was quite emotional. And I think the question is what that looks like. I mean, there's, uh, this actually also has to do with, uh, with the question of uncertainty, right? Um, I think, you know, you can see that she's frightened. You can see that she's uh, trying to figure out what to do next. Um, but there's often 
uh, when things just disappear without us seeing them end, uh, grief doesn't hit in the same way, right? Because the uncertainty of not seeing a particular end necessarily leaves open the possibility, you know, what does she know? Her, like, she doesn't know what happened to her father. You know, he's been gone several days. He could come back. Maybe he's going to come back. Maybe he's not. You know, it's at least certainly in my experience, um, the kind of emotion that I imagine having in a situation like that is less grief and more fear. And I think that that's what we see from Anna at that point in the story. And she seeks, you know, she seeks a replacement figure pretty quickly, I think, out of that sense of fear. Um, and that's how we end up with the Swallow Man. And so the Swallow Man is, is his name. And I loved in the beginning how you talked about names and the importance of names and what her name will be. Um, why, why, did, why didn't you give Swallow Man a real name is the question. I'm not sure that I agree with the premise of the question. <laughs> Um, you may recall that uh, his uh, bag has uh, a monogram on it, um, which implies that he has a name. And um, I think the Swallow Man was certainly very careful to keep his name from being known. But I don't think that's the same as him not having a name. Okay. I, I like how you're going to just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the Swallow Man becoming a golem-like figure to the boys in the house? So there, uh, as you may remember, there's a, a, a discussion of a particular Polish demon around, a demon around that time in the book called Boruta. Um, and that was more of the uh, reference that I was reaching for. Um, I don't think Polish boys in the 40s would necessarily have been aware of uh, the story of the Golem, which is a, a deeply Jewish story. Um, however, Golems are certainly very interesting to me. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, we were asked if this book is going to be made into a movie. There have been conversations. There's nothing currently planned, and certainly under the um, current set of circumstances, you know, nothing's getting made right now, unfortunately. Um, but there were definitely some fun conversations in which we daydreamed about casting, uh, which would have been a lot of fun. You know, if I had if I had my monkey's paw and my three wishes or whatever, uh, there are definitely a number of actors who I'd like to see. In the role of the Swallow Man. Um, are people... you going to share who those actors? Oh, be? sure. I mean, I, I, I think Daniel Day Lewis would do a wonderful job with it. I think uh, Mark Rylance would do a wonderful job with it. We briefly discussed. Um, oh, good lord, um, Ben. Uh, sorry, um, Bill Nye, uh, who's a wonderful English actor. They tend toward the older side. All three of those actors. We also discussed people like Ben Wishaw, who's a wonderful young actor and might uh, have been a little bit more age appropriate, though he does read young even for himself. Uh, I actually saw him do John Proctor in The Crucible on Broadway, and he's a phenomenal actor. I, I, I hope he continues to work for many years. Uh, but uh, you know, we never, we never. I think we queried a couple of. Um, there was a producer attached. At one point, we queried a couple of actors at the time that this was 2016. Mark Rylance. Had just come off of an Academy Award, and he was, you know, booked up for the near future. Um, so it didn't go anywhere. But certainly, if any of you have friends in production, you are welcome to give them my information. Okay. Um, we have a, a, so Michelle, who's doing all the research, said that the monogram on the bag is is SWG, and on the pen is DWR. Are there actual names that fit these monograms that if she continues her research um, on nuclear scientists long enough, will she eventually find them? The, sw the Swallow Man is a fictional character. <laughs> okay, she's, she's not very happy at the moment. But, <laughs> um, now there was, I think Gloria, did Gloria have a question? Anyone else? that we haven't seen? I accidentally put my name down, sorry. Gloria, do you have a question? 
Your your audio is not um, clear. Does anybody? Okay, maybe you could type it. Um, all right, so so we have a question uh, while we're working on that. Can you tell us a little bit about your next book? Oh, absolutely. It's called The Way Back. Um, it's really exciting. It's, uh, I, I mean, obviously I love all the things that I work on, but I, I love The Way Back particularly. It's uh, a sort of, I call it a shtetl fantasy. It's uh, the story of two young people, Bluma and Yehuda Leib from a little shtetl in Eastern Europe called Tupic. Uh, and what happens to them when the Malach Amavis, the, the angel of death, comes walking through their little shtetl one evening and it sends them spinning off on a, a big, uh, sort of exciting um, fantasy quest through what's called in Yiddish Yenevelt, which means that world over there, uh, which is often associated in folklore with uh, the demons that we hear so much about from our Bobbies and Zadies. Um, it's very exciting and very, you know, it's it's coming out September 15th and it'll be perfect reading for the Halloween season. It's, I would say it's spooky, not scary. Um, and it, it comes to, I hope, what is a poignant and uplifting place at the end. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's, I, I really like it a lot and I hope you will too. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a few more questions here. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I thought the author, oops, I thought the author would have been much older and was surprised at his use. <laughs> oh, I'm often surprised at my own use. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I should have read that before him. Um, <laughs> the question next is, what is the significance of the beads on the baby shoes that Swallowman ate in his crazed mode? Um, well, I think uh, you'll notice that there are some rhymes for that. I think uh, swallowing beads is similar to swallowing pills. Um, there's also uh, uh, a sort of parallel drawn between Herschel's davening three times a day and the swallow man's um, eating those beads three times a day. Um, so I think one of the things that that serves to illustrate is um, some of the swallow man's past that he's bringing forward with himself and some of his disintegration as he moves into a more precarious state. Thank you. So this next question um, prefaces it by saying you probably won't answer, <laughs> but what was in the white bundle the swallow man got from the fisherman and was he telling Anna to kill the fisherman or just giving her a final survival skill. I will say I don't think that the swallow man was telling the uh, honor to kill the the fisherman. I think um, he was invested in her being able to keep herself safe if she should need to. Um, one particular little Easter egg that I'm pleased of uh, pleased about here that I'll that I'll share with you is that the specifics of how he tells her that he might cut a throat that she might cut a throat are precisely how we're instructed to cut a throat in kosher slaughter um, which for me is significant in one way or another okay thank you um i thought the swallow man was bipolar or had some mental disease is that um, Michelle Bukai might have more information on this that she'd be willing to okay. share with Okay, so we'll come back <laughs> to her next time around. Um, uh, did, did, um, did you have a say in the choice of the narrator of the audio book? Yeah, I oh. did. Um, uh, Alan Cordiner is a wonderful English actor uh, who is also Jewish. Um, he, I think he did very, very well with the audiobook. We're hoping that he'll agree to do the audiobook for The Way Back as well. Um, I, I think he's a wonderful actor. I think he's thoughtful. I think he's talented. Uh, you can have a lot of fun going down his IMDb page and finding him in like every movie that you've ever seen in some little back corner. Actually, specifically, one of the great performances uh, that he's got uh, on film is in a movie called Topsy Turvy about um, Gilbert and Sullivan in which he plays Arthur Sullivan and he's wonderful. 
Um, and I had a yeah, I had a chance to meet him and spend some time with him. Uh, we were lucky that the audiobook version of Man on the Swallow Man was honored with the Odyssey Award, which is um, kind of the the young adult uh, audiobook Oscar. <laughs> um, and so we we met at that celebration. He's a wonderful guy, um, and I'm I'm very privileged that he's been able to work on my writing. That's great. Um... So we have in the chat quite a few um, ideas about what kind of pills he was taking and also what his um, his medical state was, but I don't think we'll um, uh, get into that. As the, as the father of a young daughter, does it bother you that Anna is willing to follow an unknown man? You know, it's certainly not the best case scenario. Um, uh, you know, I, it's too horrible to imagine my own daughter in a situation like this, but God forbid, I should, I should not be able to take care of her or her mother should not be able to take care of her. I hope she would be able to find someone who, who might. And I think if you, you know, look at people's experiences under these terrible uh, sets of circumstances, people only ever really survive by banding together and certainly young people need looking after. That's a hard one. That's... Yeah. Uh, the quote, each man is the steward of his own soul also seems to tie into the end and Anna being able to assess what will happen and be able to survive. Is... Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's got to be the swallow man's guiding principle in certain ways. You know, you have to make the difficult decisions that that you have to make in order to to come to the the best possible outcome. This is an interesting question. Um, I love it. So, you're a writer, mm -hmm. and we're reading your book. What are some of the books that you read? Oh. Or who are your favorite authors or recommended authors? Um, I'm a weird reader. I, unfortunately, I get antsy when I'm reading a book and the author does something that I would do differently. So sometimes uh, I'm, a, I'm a difficult audience to please. I will say uh, throughout the course of, of this quarantine, I've read quite a few of the volumes of Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey and Maturin series, which are a wonderful set of historical novels set in the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy in the early part of the 19th century. And for me, I mean, firstly, the writing is very smart. The prose is fantastic. The, um, the research is impeccable. Um, so it's really, it's kind of a ticket uh, for some escapism. Um, and that's really been <laughs> what I need these days. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, some some you know escapist naval battles on the on the open seas are wonderful um actually as it happens right now i'm in the process of rereading the lord of the rings um i don't know what possessed me but i, I dove back in I'm in the middle of the two towers right now and i'm actually really enjoying tracking all the weird uh hebraicisms that tolkien uses uh it's well known uh, tolkien was a, a linguist and a philologist by trade and he was a uh, professor at the university of oxford uh, and he, he played around with language a lot. But if you if you pay close attention, there's a lot of like em suffixes that he uses for plurals uh, in some of the Elvish. And I don't know if uh, this is getting very deep, but uh, uh, if if you recall, there's a character called Tom Bombadil early on in the in the Fellowship of the Ring who's a kind of magical, um, fun loving spirit who is described as being um, eldest, like the oldest entity in Middle Earth. And uh, the elves later on say that his name in their language is Iawen Ben Adar, which I think is awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a nerd like that. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll all have to go back and read now. Yeah. Um, so um, in reference to following strange men, Anna was not, so this goes back to the question before, Anna was not inclined to reach out to the woman who was her neighbor. What, any oh. thoughts on that? 
Old Mrs. Nemchik? Yeah, she's 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 never been very nice to Anna. I, I wouldn't, you know, again, putting myself in her position, I, I, I would probably not go to someone who's not been nice to me in the past looking for help. Mm. Uh, a little, <laughs> a little fun little Easter egg about uh, old Mrs. Nemchik actually, is that when I was first writing this book, I had no notion that it would ever be published. I was just playing around for myself. And so I named these characters in a little bit of a haphazard way. And old Mrs. Nemchik is actually nem named after a girl who uh, I dated a couple of times in college and who didn't return my calls. <laughs> um, and like by the time we got to, to the copy editing phase it was like do I do I want to change this name or do I not care and I decided you know if she should happen to pick it up that like it she's named after a, a crabby old woman should be her, her punishment <laughs> and and has she contacted you you know she still has not called me back all right need to get you on uh color wars the uh the the Jewish geography game show on Facebook. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, so got a couple last ones. Uh, did you ever consider other titles for the book? The working title of the book was The Swallow Man. Um, and I was advised, I think, correctly that opening it up a little bit more, uh, making it sound a little bit more fairy tale-ish uh, by adding Anna into the title was a good idea. Uh, which I agree with. Beyond that, there was never anything that was like stuck to the project. Um, but there was certainly, I, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly good at titles. Titles are really challenging for me. Um, I think because optimally a good title is a billboard and is not particularly concerned with storytelling or aesthetics or poetry. Um, and I always want to get too clever with titles. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a somewhere in some notebook, there's a list as long as my arm of things that are like all far too arch and literary. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, the only two titles that are like, that were ever really attached to the book were The Swallow Man and Anna and the Swallow Man. Well, and I think also that becomes, the title becomes a narrative in and of, in and of itself. And that leads you down a, a, a perspective. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, at, title, it, so. it, at best, a title should be an invitation. Yeah. Okay, um, we are coming to our end, but I want to just get in a, a couple more here. Um, so a uh, comment that some uh, loved your concept of daddiness. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was something I discussed before I became a daddy myself, um, but I, I think it holds up. <laughs> okay, and so did you give, did you give up musical theater now? You know, there's not a lot of commercial musical theater in Springfield, Illinois, unfortunately. Um, I have, I'm still on the books with my theatrical agent out in New York. Um, uh, and a couple of years ago, I, I flew in for some auditions. The truth of the matter is it's pretty challenging to pursue. It's a, I mean, obviously it's a very, very competitive field. It's pretty challenging to pursue at a distance. Um, but furthermore, and this is something that I, I really, you know, it's difficult because people have the sense that the arts are frivolous and expendable in certain ways. But I just want to mention that the entire New York theater industry now has been shut down um, by COVID-19 and they're, uh, they're not going to open at all this year. That's another six months of unemployment in a multi-billion dollar industry that employs more people full time than the United States coal industry. Uh, those are real jobs and real people. And it's it's heartbreaking and difficult because there's no easy answer uh, other than to say that it's very important as we move forward to prioritize uh, support and funding for the arts in our communities. Because if we don't take care of artists, then we lose art, which is ultimately, certainly for me, and I think in general, one of the main reasons we're all having a good time if we are, you know, <laughs> like, what do we do when we can't do anything else? Well, we turn on Netflix. What happens if there's no <laughs> actors? Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, I, in some ways, I feel very lucky not to currently be deriving my living from theater because there's no work. Um, and in other ways, I feel kind of guilty um, because I have a lot of very dear friends who are out there without any options. Thank you. And and with that, 
um, we want to thank you so My pleasure. very thank much, you all so much for reading the book. Uh, this, this is great, and um, we're not done yet because we, we're going to plug our next book with our next author. And so um, we just want to thank you so much, and we look forward to having you back when your book, your next book, uh, The Way Back, comes out. So will you join us again? Absolutely. It'll be my pleasure. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce you now to Hetty from Budapest. Hetty works for Partnership. And because of Hetty, we have our next book, which is called The Book of Fathers and um, by a Hungarian author. And Hetty, take it away. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, Gabrielle, for this wonderful uh, discussion. It was really, really inspiring. I really enjoyed. And also to our organizers, Avital and Noah, Marcy, thank you. It was such an inspiring program. I'm very happy that I could take part. And it's also super nice to see familiar faces all around my screen. And uh, it helps to survive these uh, hard times. So thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you for having us as Budapest. And I'm very privileged that I can introduce you our first Hungarian book in the book club. So here is the Hungarian uh, version, the original version, and uh, the Book of Fathers, or in Hebrew, Sefer Havot. It was pretty challenging to find the book which is translated both to Hebrew and English, but we think that uh, the deepest uh, experience of reading a book is, is on your uh, native language. So I'm very happy that we managed to find one. And uh, also we are very lucky that the author of the book Miklos Vamos, who is one of the best uh, um, writers of today in Hungary, he accepted our invitation to our next session, which will be on November 15th, if I'm right, Avital. Um, I think also the topic of the book will help you to understand the Hungarian Jewish experience and what we can share together in partnership. Uh, this book uh, leads us through 300 centuries of Hungarian Jewish history, uh, through the private story of a Jewish family. So you will understand why we don't smile so much, but also we will, <laughs> uh, we will share many experiences through reading this book. So uh, I'm looking forward to meet you on the next uh, session and enjoy the book and let's discuss it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hetty. And um, Noah, do you want to close us out? Before closing, I, I, I was so excited at the beginning, really. I really want to thank, I mean, there's so many people to thank, but uh, I want to thank especially Marcy, Dr. Marcy Paul, and Noah Hanukkah, uh, the two leaders of this program, uh, and they're doing such a wonderful job, and they are good friends, and I think their good friendship and personality really reflects on this group. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.